All right, awesome, thank you. All right, guys, so uh, my name's Evan Padua. As you know, uh, my father, Mike Padua, and I own Sweetwater Guide Service on the Upper Delaware River. Um, I was born and raised in Narrowsburg, New York, um, right on the Delaware, the narrowest and deepest point, as you may have seen on Jeopardy recently. Um, <laughs> it was a funny little question. And uh, growing up there, needless to say, my father was a fisherman and super into the outdoors, and he started guiding pretty quickly uh, into my life. He started in 91, and I was born in 91, so uh, my father being a fishing guide, I kind of grew up under, underneath his wing, um, and then in my adult life, kind of took it upon myself to learn a bunch of new things. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about my uh, professional background and uh, kind of how I got to where I am today. And then I'll touch base on some uh, areas of fishing around our area in the upper Delaware and the surrounding um, bodies of water. Um, so in 2009, I graduated from Honesdale High School and I moved, uh, I ended up moving to the state of Wyoming. Uh, the Tetons are right behind me in this painting that my wife painted. And I spent a lot of time in the Teton area of um, the Wyoming Idaho border. Um, and I actually had a connection to Southeast Alaska uh, via a um, guide course that I had taken in the past. And I ended up getting a whitewater raft guiding job in Alaska in 2009. Right out of high school, I decided I'm moving to Alaska as far away as possible. I was, I was a little naive in that move, but I uh, enjoyed every moment and looked back as it was a great experience. Um, so I spent the summer of 2010, it was uh, in Alaska guiding whitewater rafting trips and fishing for a lot of salmon while I was there. I caught Dolly Varden while I was there, um, hiked a lot of different mountains and different um, glacial rivers and different things in Alaska. Fast forwarding a little bit, I then moved back to the, the Wyoming area, I was living in Jackson, Wyoming for uh, three years and I was guiding whitewater rafting on the Snake River uh, right out of Jackson Hole and a little bit south in the Snake River Canyon, which is the Wyoming portion. Uh, most people would call it the Upper Snake River. Uh, it's pretty far um, north in the river system. So once I was guiding there, I was kind of looking, I was guiding a lot of trips on the whitewater, working long days, and I was looking at the fishing guides next to me while I was running whitewater, and I remember thinking, I can do that, and the money was quite a bit better, and I was like, I know how to do that, and it looks a little more, a little more, a little easier, and I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to go into the fishing guiding. So I started part-time guiding in Wyoming with a couple of companies. Uh, and then pretty immediately decided I got to go help my father out on the Delaware because the Delaware is my home. It's where I know all the water. I know all the fish. Um, I know so much about this river. I spent my childhood swimming in it with goggles and, and flippers and looking all throughout the rocks. I could see tons of fish, which is an incredible way to, you know, really figure out a fishery to actually look into it, you know. Um, so about five years ago or six years ago, I guess it was, this is my sixth season now on the upper Delaware with Sweetwater Guide Service um, and my father. And so we are super busy. Uh, we do about 250 fishing trips a year between the two of us. Um, each, each spring, summer, fall, um, we work pretty much, we call it full time throughout April through October. Um, it slows a little bit down in the fall, um, but we are super busy in the spring. Um, so kind of, that's kind of my professional background. Um, spent a lot of time on rivers. I've logged a ton of miles. Uh, I am also a lake fisherman, but I mostly, my professional life has been on rivers and streams, which I'll talk a lot about today, um, how to fish rivers and streams and how to fish some of the area's lakes and ponds. And also a lot of it is universal knowledge, how to fish um, a river or a stream. It can relate very similar to lakes, um, but there are very, there's a lot, there's a lot to it. Um, so we're gonna kind of start at square one, just basic fishing equipment right out of the gate, all right? If you're going out fishing for a regular day of fishing, 
there's a couple things that if I go, if I had, if I don't have them, I feel like I am completely unprepared. And one number one thing, I'm wearing it on the top of my head. It's a hat. All right, block the sun. It's gonna protect your head from hooks. You you never know what you're if you're walking through brambles or whatever. You want to protect your head. A hat is a number one uh, fishing hat. You gotta have your fishing hat. All right. Number two, sunglasses. Super simple. Polarized sunglasses. They don't have to be the super expensive kind. Thirty dollar polarized lenses. Generally, the brown lenses are the best. Um, brown polarized lenses are very good to see into water. Um, I'd recommend um, if you're just trying to take notes or something, have a little pen and paper if anybody's, or if you have questions that you want to write down for later, uh, that we'll have a Q&A also about any of these topics uh, that you can bring up later um, in, the, in the session here. Um, so hat and sunglasses, so simple, right? Uh, but I literally would feel naked anywhere fishing without hat and sunglasses. Sunglasses or regular glasses are good because they also protect your eyes from hooks or any sort of thing, whether you're walking through the woods or in a boat, you know, it's just really good to have eye protection. Um, and then because of the way my day was today, I was out on the river all day in the rain. So you better have your rain gear. You never know when one of those pop summer storms or whatever is going to pop up on you. So rain gear, I was telling people before, it's hard to have good enough rain gear on a day like today because I spend a lot of money on rain gear and I still don't stay dry. So it's, 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 uh, it's tough, but you, you know, you just power through it when you're out fishing. Um, boots and waders, things like that, you know, um, sandals, you want to be able to step in the water to some degree when you're fishing, because if, if you're landing a fish or all of a sudden you got your lure stuck or your, your fly stuck, you know, all these things, you need to be able to approach the water with enough capability to get in maybe to the edge of the water with your boots or possibly up to your knees, at least with your sandals safely wading into the water. Um, if this is the case, um, so this is very basic um, tackle and, and things like that. And then obviously, you know, a rod, a reel and, and, and line and, and some lures. So we're just going to go kind of over um, some basic fishing tactics in this area and kind of the, the basic fishing equipment that I use on a daily basis that works all the time. Um, and I, and I have learned over the years to, you know, close down the quiver a little bit. You don't need 800 million things out there every day. If you bring one little tackle box or one little fly box, you stick to your, your go-tos, you're probably going to catch more fish than if you have an entire suitcase full of stuff that you're not using every day. Um, we'll start a little bit with, um, I'm going to start with some spin fishing. Um, there's two different things. I'm going to grab these rods and reels here. This is a fly reel um, for fly fishing and a thicker line. This is called fly line. And then this is a spinning reel, which most of you are probably familiar with. It's your basic reel that you would use um, most times on a, a fishing excursion. Um, so I'm just going to talk mostly Um, to start, I'm going to talk a little bit about some spin fishing tactics in the local rivers, such as the Delaware, and then as well, um, local ponds and lakes in this area. I, swish, I fish Swinging Bridge a lot. I fish um, Lake Huntington, you know, as far as my lakes go in the local area and, and um, all, kinds of, all kinds of different um, things. I like to fish for smallmouth bass. I like to fish for walleye. I fish for rainbow trout, brown trout, brook trout, tiger trout. Um, you know, there's a, a variety of species of fish in this area, stripe, stripers, um, striped bass. They are in some lakes around here as well as the river. Um, so I target a variety of game species. Um, there's a lot of different fish out there to catch, such as, um, you know, even suckers and carp and catfish and all these things that are bottom feeders. I also fish for catfish. Um, so, you know, I kind of enjoy being a jack of all trades in the fishing world. I spend a lot of time working and targeting the river, the river fish in the Delaware. So on my free time, I tend to veer away and kind of fish for different species and find new water because that's what excites me as a fisherman. Um, I love just the whole idea of going out fishing 
you know, it's not always, obviously we always say it's not always about the fish and, you know, you might not catch anything or you might catch one little fish or one big fish, uh, but you might see an amazing, I mean, I've seen some amazing <laughs> close encounters with deer and, and turkeys and, you know, all kinds of crazy, uh, I saw a male fox the other day on the river, you know, so you're out there in, in, in nature, really just becoming one with the, one with the, you know, the world. And especially, you know, this time of year, if you're harvesting baby Japanese knotweed or fiddleheads or morels or anything, the river is loaded with life. You know, that's why these fish are in there. It's, it's loaded with life. So there's so many different things about around streams and around rivers and around ponds and lakes that are thriving. And, you, you know, that's kind of all about the experience of fishing. It's not just about casting your line in and, and hoping to catch a fish. Um, but let's get to that anyway, because that's the fun part. Um, so coming back to some spin fishing um, type of tactics with, with your spinning reels, um, I, I like to use six pound test Berkeley line. I'm just gonna put it up here so you can kind of see what it looks like. Most of it comes on a spool. You can buy it at any tackle shop. Six pound test is great for 90% of the fish in our area. Um, you can use eight pound test also, um, but you don't really need 10, 15, 20 pound tests unless you're fishing for, you know, bigger fish such as striped bass or, you know, something, a pike or, or ocean fish. Really six, eight, 10 pound test maximum um, around here is, is really all you need. Fishermen of all kinds have their own opinion on that. And a lot of people use um, what's called braid. This is 10 pound braid. I'm sorry, I don't know, there we go. 10 pound braid. Braid is, it looks more like thread. I know it's really hard to see, but it looks more like thread and it, it is braided like thread um, as opposed to a monofilament or a fluorocarbon line that is more generally used or has been used um, you know, since a long time ago, which braid is kind of a new thing. It doesn't have stretch braid the line, so when you're fishing with it, you can feel the things on the end of your line very, very well with the braid. Um, but there are pros and cons not having stretch in your line when you set the hook. And if you're using certain leaders, leader material, that's kind of an extensive thing. And if you have a question about braid or monofilament and fluorocarbon, feel free to ask me later. And I'll uh, elaborate a little bit more on that, but I don't want to get too caught up on it. Um, that being said, a lot of people have issues lining their reels, okay? Getting the line from this spool onto the fishing reel that they have at their house or in their garage or, you know, that they just got for Christmas. My favorite way to do it is literally put this on the ground. I then, I run my fishing line. I run my fishing line. Let me just take this. Hold on one second. All right, I run my fishing line through the first, this is called a guide, this on your fishing rod. I run it through just the first guide on the fishing rod. And then you run it down to your reel with the reel bit, the bale needs to be open on your reel. And you then tie it onto the spool. The spool is completely empty with no line on it, okay? Um, you tie it on with using an improved clinch knot is what I use 99% of the time for that. Um, if you need, you know, some people use different knots. Um, you should really never trust the knot at the bottom of the spool because you never want to get completely spooled. Um, but that, that's, you, I can tell you a little more about that in a minute. But um, so if you tie the line off of your spool like this through the first guide of your fishing rod, and then you then take your right hand and hold the line or your left hand, depending on if you're right or your lefty, you want to hold the line with tension um, before it is then entering into the reel. You, it's also good to wet wet the spool of line that you're putting on there. You can soak it in water, or you can put, um, you know, you can wet it with a with a faucet, and you wet it so it has a little lubrication. And as you reel, and you're standing directly above of the spool. Okay, some people put these on dobbin, uh, you know, a, a bobbin, and they spin. I prefer to just stand directly above it so the line comes straight up in through the guide and onto my reel. It works for me. People have different opinions on that, but 
I feel like a lot of people spin the line spins as it goes on to your fishing reel and then you have problems immediately. I find that it doesn't spin when I do it this way. Um, and then you would continue to provide tension against the line that's going on to your reel. You'd reel, 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 reel. You keep going, going, going. I stop about every 30 seconds. And this is the drag on your reel right here. It's lefty loosey, righty tighty. So if I loosen it up, I want it a little tighter than that. I stop every 30 seconds and I pull and make sure that it's sitting onto the reel very tightly as I'm putting it on. And you're watching it fill, fill up the spool on your reel as you're going, okay? Um, and you just continue to do that until there's, it's almost full. You don't wanna overfill your spool ever because it then flip, comes right off the top and it, and it causes tangles with your line. So it's very important to not overfill your spool. Um, you want about a 16th of an inch at the top of your spool to be able to see um, that the line is, is not um, gonna come over the top of the spool, about a 16th of an inch um, from the end. Um, and that goes the same with fly line. You do not wanna over, if you're putting fly line on a reel, it's a little bit different, but fly line going on a reel like this, you want your backing. This one actually doesn't have enough backing on it, um, unfortunately, but you, you put backing on first and then fill this up and you want it to come about 16th of an inch from the end of the, of the, uh, the arbor of the reel there, um, which is slightly different. If you have a question about fly line um, spooling later, feel free to ask. But th that's just step one, because you can't really go fishing with a, a rod and reel that isn't working properly. So it's important to have um, your kind of base setup of a rod and reel that will work for you. So you can go out there and actually have a good time rather than deal with tangles and knots and problems all, all day long. Um, I also am a firm believer of cutting the line and retying when you get knots in your in your line knots are going to happen no matter what i mean the, the best of us um think we have good line control and we get a lot less knots <laughs> we don't get a whole lot but when they do happen um you bring the line down you might look at it you cut the line and just retie it onto your whether it's onto your reel or it's onto your lure or your fly you just cut it and retie it don't spend all day trying to untangle it because you're going to get it untangled if you're lucky and it's still going to be um, abraded so after you untangle it the line will then be weaker and in which case the next time you hook into a big fish the line will break um, so it's very important to have good line management on your reel and constantly checking i'm always i it's very hard to see fishing line obviously but i'm always pole testing pulling on my fishing line that's connected to the lure that i'm using or the fly that i'm using to make sure it's not going to break immediately because you know if you if you pull on it immediately and it breaks then you know as soon as a fish eats it um, you're unfortunately not going to keep that fish on the line so line is a huge huge part of fishing uh, it's very important to kind of know how to tie knots um, again i use the improved clinch most of the time um, with spinning tackle um, and it's, it's pretty easy knot. There's a lot of videos. Animatednots.com is really good for learning because you can do it step by step, um, which works really well. Um, so let's just, let's just talk about kind of approaching um, the waters. Let's say you have your, your so I, I use mostly medium light, six foot, somewhere in the six foot range, five, I would say five to seven feet, but um, rods. I use spinning rods. So they have the eyes are pointed down with the reel. They're not up this way. That would be called a bait casting rod, which is slightly different. I don't bait cast fish much. So um, this is a spinning rod with the guides down. This is a six foot rod. It's medium light action with a pretty soft, it's got a very soft um, tip here at the top. I don't know if you can see right against my shirt, but it's pretty soft right there. So it's really, it's really quite sensitive. Um, so when you're using, when you're using small little um, lures or flies or jigs, you can really feel at the end of the rod 
um, what's going on. Um, it's really important to have um, a feel to what's at the end of your line. So that way when a fish eats it, you know, and you can set the hook into their mouth and then bring them into shore or the net wherever you are. Um, so I often am using a six foot um, fishing rod with six pound test. There you go, it's pretty simple. Six foot fishing rod with six pound test. I got about 15 rods in the garage and I would say more than half of them have six, six pound test on them. Um, so around here, you know, when I am approaching the water, it's kind of, uh, if you guys are hunters or if you've spent any time hunting, um, you know, it's important to be very quiet and, and stealthy. You know, you can't expect to catch fish if you're splashing around in the water or tossing rocks or unfortunately, your dog might not be your best fishing partner if he runs into the fishing pool before you get there, you know? So it's important to be pretty stealthy when you're fishing. So as you approach the pond or the lake or the river, when you get there, you kind of want to walk slow, look at what's going on. Are there any fish hitting the surface? Are there, you know, is there swirls? Is there lily pads? Is there weeds? Are there some rocks? You know, because depending on what you're looking for, you know, bass in this area like rocks, they like structure. And in the middle of the summer, they might be in the lily pads. Um, so it's important to kind of know what you're looking for to fish um, as you're approaching the water. Um, and especially with streams and rivers, as you're approaching, um, it's important to know, you know, kind of where the channel of the river is. Uh, which the Delaware is a hard one because it's so wide and flat that hard people have a hard time determining where the channel is. But in general, when a river turns to the right, the channel will be on the outside of the turn. It'll be on the left side. So that's a very, you know, just like a road, when you drive around a left turn, you're leaning to the right side of your car, the water gets pushed to the outside bend. Um, so as you're approaching to a small creek or, or the Delaware River, you're looking at the water thinking, okay, is the channel all the way over there? Or is it right here close to me? And likely more fish will be in the channel. There are certain times of year that on rivers and streams, fish will move out of the channel, such as during a flood or um, during their spawning seasons, depending on the fish species. Um, that being said, I would, if you fish in the channel of the river or stream, you're likely going to catch more fish than if you're not fishing in the channel is kind of what I'm getting at. Um, so that's kind of an, an approach as when you, when you approach a, pond, a, a river or stream, find, I would recommend the channel. I mean, there's often, um, the channel can be three feet deep or it could be 40 feet deep. So that's the thing. If it's a big wide spot and it's, and it's 12 inches deep all the way across, but there's one spot that's three feet deep, you're likely going to have a better, better lock in that three foot deep spot. So it's, it's more about just knowing where the channel is. The depth can vary a lot. And that then leads to which kind of tackle or lure or fly you would, you would be using um, to, to fish there. Um, okay, let's just talk a little bit about um, the upper Delaware specifically, only because it's really fresh on my mind and I've been working on it every day for the past two weeks. And I've got 43 fishing trips in a row. So I'm uh, 10, about one quarter of that in, uh, and we're catching a lot of fish. Our first 10 trips, or no, it was our first 20 trips collectively between my father and I, we had 10 brown trout over 20 inches, which is a pretty good number for our start. Our, unfortunately, our, our um, size quota has been dropping in the, in the recent <laughs> trips, but, but we had a lot of big trout this, this spring. Um, and in the spring, what happens, trout are cold water fish. They like cold water. However, when it's really cold, their metabolisms are, metabolisms are slow. Um, so they don't eat that much food because if they eat too much, they can't process it. And then in turn, they actually will die if they take, eat too much when their metabolism can't process it. Um, so about 80% of a trout's diet, whether it's a brown trout, a rainbow trout, um, all these different um, fish, about 80% of it is generally bugs, entom entomology, bugs, tons and tons of bugs. Um, they do eat a lot of meat, like such as small bait fish. And in certain areas, there is a larger amount of bait fish for trout to eat, and they might have more. And that 
that percentage might be a little different in certain areas across the country. Um, but in the Delaware, definitely the trout are, they eat a lot of bugs. So that's why people fly fish a lot in, on the Delaware is because the trout are easy to catch um, with a fly rod. Um, that being said, they're also easy and fun to catch on a spinning rod. So as, you, as you're looking at the water in the spring, um, it's nice to see the temperature rising, right? Just like the temperature rises on, you know, in April, uh, we had an 80 degree day to yesterday or whatever it was. Um, and as the water temperature rises, the fish, their metabolisms wake up and they, there's more food around, the bugs start to hatch, so they're eating bugs. Now they're processing food and they're getting more energy. So the fish are then more aggressive um, to eat. You can catch trout in the winter time. And a lot of times you're literally targeting them with the smallest possible bait or, of, or tackle you could imagine. Um, there's a bug called a zebra midge or a midge that is the smallest bug that you've ever seen that, that lands on your you know, back or your neck once in a while or whatever. But that right there, if you can see it, is a zebra midge on a size probably 18 hook. I can't quite, there we go. I don't know if you can see the hook very well, but there we go. Um, but in the winter time, that would be pretty much my number one bait to catch a trout because I know they're not eating a lot of, a lot of they're not eating um, you know, a bigger uh, lure like this because their metabolism can't, can't, um, uh, process it. So they're going to eat a small, small bug when the water say is 35 degrees or 40, basically below 40 degrees, to be honest. Um, so as the water warms in the spring, the fish get more aggressive and you can get away with fishing, um, bait fish patterns, you know, that look like small fish and all trout have teeth. So they, they're carnivores. They're going to eat, um, they they have teeth on their tongues. I took a picture of, of, uh, the tongue of this brown trout the other day and it had amazing teeth on it. It was a really, really cool um, shot. Or my wife actually took the picture, but um, it, it was way cool. So these, these fish can be fooled um, using a light line, like six pound test or four pound test even so, because trout are very skittish. They, they don't like, they will, if they see you, they're going the other way. Um, they're not like a bass that will maybe swim around and come back to your area or something. The trout, they're gonna, you, you don't wanna spook, spook any trout. And before the rain today, the water was very low and very clear, um, which leads to difficulty trying to be um, you know, stealthy. So you have to be even more stealthy when the water's low and clear, which then you might need to tie four pound test instead of six pound test because it's even smaller and harder to see for the fish and, and the angler. Um, it's important to understand the drag system on your fishing reels um, when you're using light line, because if you're not using light, if you're not using um, the drag on your fishing reel correctly, um, you will break the line immediately when you either get stuck or, or catch, catch a fish. So I can kind of go through the drag, but it's basically righty tighty lefty loosey with the drag system on most reels, fly, fly reels and spinning reels. And then I was actually just reading on this, this uh, new reel I had the other day. It said that you should have one third the amount of drag test on your reel as you, you would have for the line. So that would be six pound test, it would be two pounds of drag. Um, I would argue that it's probably closer to two thirds the amount if you can fight the fish effectively. Um, which means there's enough tension so the line can come out of your reel when you have a fish on the line, but not too much that they just pull as much as they want. Um, and it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a thing that you have to really understand um, as you're fishing. Um, and each, every single reel is different too. So um, I would just spend a little bit of time if you're curious about the drag systems on your, your fishing reels. Um, your line and your drag is just like super important with fishing. So, um, you know, do a little research, ask me a question if you have a question about it, or, you know, do a little research on your own about the drag system of your specific fishing reel and, and kind of see how it works with, with your line. Um, so coming back to the, to the upper Delaware right now, um, 
these brown trout and these rainbow trout rainbow trout seem they spawn in the spring but they seem to have already spawned this year there's a lot of really healthy ones in the river right now and so they may or may not have already spawned um but they're aggressive right now because the water has warmed from 38 degrees two weeks ago to 55 degrees this week um, so once it's in that 50 degree range i pretty much know that the trout are going to be active and they're going to be feeding um, so today uh, was an interesting day. We were able to catch trout on a variety of different um, lures and also flies, um, which is the cool thing about our river. I use a lot of these um, small, they're called rapalas. This is an X-wrap. It's a really natural color, silver on the bottom, black on the top. I, I replaced the trebles. You've seen hooks that have three. Um, I replaced them with single hooks. Um, because I like to be nice to the fish and I catch a lot of fish. Um, so I, I don't switch them out on all of my equipment, but I do switch them out on a, a fair amount. Um, this is a really good lure here. Also a Rapala. Um, it's called a brown, it looks exactly like a brown trout. This is what a brown trout looks like, okay? This is a baby brown trout. It's about three inches long. It's got red spots on the side. It literally looks verbatim um, of what a small brown trout looks like. And unfortunately, brown trout are, are cannibals or whatever. They eat their, their own young all the time. And if you're using a brown trout pattern to catch brown trout, it's likely going to work. Um, you're likely going to get some strikes um, from some brown trout on a brown trout pattern. Um, when it comes to flies, that's like a gold pattern, uh, gold and brown, gold and red. Um, using for a streamer that looks like a bait fish, a small bait fish. I, I might have forgot. Hold on one second. Give me one second. Here we go. All right. I thought I had it by this on my table here. So this is a streamer here. This is like a small, hairy, I tied this with a little bit of thread and some feathers, yellow looking. This doesn't, this is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's almost, it's a little bit of a similar color, not, not perfect. I wasn't trying to imitate that. I just happened to grab this one. But same thing with a fly. If you're using a fly rod um, and you wanted to imitate a brown trout or something, you'd want to tie something that looks like this um, or that looks like a brown trout um, or, you know, there's a lot of different it's good to know what kind of bait fish are in the water that you're fishing. So a lot of um, fisheries specifically only have, you know, alewife herring or sculpin or crayfish, um, you know, and all of these baits, all of these natural foods that the fish eat are what they're going to hit, like they're what you're likely going to catch them on um, rather than using something. If you're using a perch pattern in a place where there's no yellow perch, you're not really using a, a good um, tactic to, to catch the fish that you're fishing for. Um, so you wanna make sure you're um, imitating a bait pattern uh, that you know is in the river. So this here, I'm just gonna show you a couple lures because um, these all work in the Delaware if you're interested in fishing. This is a baby walleye color, gold. Again, I replaced the hooks with single hooks. Um, you don't have to do that. That's just what I do. Um, these are silver. They look, see how realistic, I mean, it looks like a little fish, right? Um, so as you're swimming through the water, you know, this fish right here will catch 10 different species in the Delaware. And I've done it on one single trip even. You can catch a bass, a walleye, um, a striped bass, a trout, uh, three different kinds of trout. You can catch fall fish, native fish. You know, there's there, these little bait fish patterns because there's um, baby shad in the upper Delaware any silver bait fish pattern pretty much is going to going to work. Um, you know, there's, there's, I'm an, I like to fish natural colors. Everything I have is like a silvery, you know, kind of a silver and shimmer, um, ch chain pickerel, you know, chain pickerel color. This one's super beat up and this one because it's beat up because I've been catching a ton of fish on it in the Delaware this summer, uh, or this spring rather just in the last couple of weeks, it's been, it's been pretty darn good. Um, Going on to the metal game, um, spinners. Also, again, on six pound test, I use a Blue Fox Vibrax spinner. Um, this is a silver number three. Um, the, every spinner company has different, um, different numbers in the sizes. So it's hard to explain that right now, but 
I use number two and number three blades for, for um, blue foxes. And I use a barrel swivel. It's really, oh, let me see if I can. I use a barrel swivel with a clip, these little tiny metal things. And it essentially helps prevent your line from spinning up and then in turn prevents you from having more tangles in your line and your reel throughout the day. Some people don't like to use the swivels because they think it is too much metal in front of the spinner on the line. Um, I agree with them that it is more metal and, and it causes probably me to miss some fish or not get as many hits. But I find that it, because I use such a small one, I think it works and uh, it's what I like to do. These are the smaller versions of the same thing, a gold number two. I cut the hooks off, so I only have one hook on there. I like to do that because I catch a lot of fish, so I like to be you know, nice to them, so I'm not putting treble hooks in their mouth all the time. Um, I do catch and release. About 90% of the fish I catch, I catch and release. I catch and eat walleye out of the Delaware a lot in the summer and fall. Walleye season opens this Saturday. Um, so pretty much any walleye I catch, I'm probably going to be bringing home. Um, they're one of the few fish that are still actively stocked in the Delaware, not around here, not around the upper Delaware, but they are stocked, um, on the New Jersey border. Um, and they put an ungodly amount of walleye fry in the river, a couple million, um, in the river a few years back now, I think it was in 2015 or something. So I feel like uh, there's plenty of walleye um, to be eaten and and they're delicious. So if you can get a, get out there and catch a walleye, uh, they're, they're pretty, pretty tasty. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys like kind of some of the stuff that I use, you know, in this area. This is a small jig, a little, little tiny jig with some hair on the back. Um, these are great for small creeks. Um, you can use them on a fly rod or a spinning rod. It just looks like a small black, either a small black bait fish or a little um, stonefly nymph. Stoneflies are very prevalent in all of the water that we fish around here. Uh, they, they are, you've probably seen the casings on little rocks when you go to the creek or 10 mile river. Um, stoneflies are, they have legs and they have double wings that come out and they hatch out of the river constantly. Um, pretty much 12 months of the year, stoneflies are hatching. And so it's a constant food source for fish. So no fish is, is a stranger to eating a stonefly. So it's good to have imitations of stoneflies. Um, and these little things, this is the same kind of thing. It looks like a jig uh, or it looks like a stonefly or it might look like a leech or an eel. I tie these with marabou and a small little jig head. I think this is a 16th ounce jig head. Um, some are lead and some are tungsten. Um, there's different kinds of jig heads you can use. Um, most Fishing areas don't have restrictions on lead, um, which is, uh, I find a little bit interesting, but I try not to use it if I don't have to um, as a jig head, because you don't like putting lead in the water if you don't have to. Um, but that, you know, it's it, this kind of small black, this is pretty tiny. I know it's hard to tell. Um, it's about one and a half inches long, probably. And a 16th ounce is, is pretty light also. Um, and it, it's good for small creeks um, or a small pond for panfish or perch. Um, any kind of jig like that will definitely work. Um, those small, and you can use like, here's, what, here's a better example of one. So little jig head, little brown bodied. And then I have a, this is actually rabbit fur that makes the tail. Um, so it swims a little bit as it's going through the water. Um, so these little, these little types of things are, are great. Um, it's not, Big fish don't necessarily eat big baits, okay? They don't need to, you don't have to use something that's really long and giant. Um, you don't have to use something that's as big as this. This is a musky lure, okay? This is something you fish for, for a 50 inch barracuda fish, giant, giant, giant. But most of the time I'd say anywhere between one and a half to four inches is a good size um, to imitate a bait fish. Um, pretty small. You know, you don't really want to go bigger than four inches ever um, because then it becomes a, a mature fish and most most big fish aren't even going to eat a four inch fish. I mean, maybe in the fall when you're fishing for walleye. Um, but just one more thing. These are the secret weapons. So if you have a pen and paper, I'd write it down, but uh, I, I don't tell everyone about them. But these right here, you can buy them at Tom's Bait and Tackle. This is a four inch swim bait. Kai Tech, it's called. 
And uh, this right here, if you throw it in the river with six pound test line and a small jig head, 16th ounce or eighth ounce, um, I can show you what it looks like out of the package here. And you can ask me later, but it looks like a small fish. It's got a swim tail there. I mean, it already looks like it's alive, right? I mean, it's incredible. Um, and the hook, these are, this is a jig head here. And then the hooks coming out of the top. Now, when you, every fish you've seen pretty much across the board has a darker back than it does belly. Okay. So when I rig this up, the line is tied to the top and it swims through the water with the dark side, the dark side is up. So it looks natural. So it's dark side up, light color down. Some people use them with the, the white side down. You know, everybody has their own way of fishing things and doing things, but I prefer to have natural presentations. And because I fish very natural presentations, it's because I fish clear water in the Delaware and in the, you know, the reservoirs around here, it's very clear. Um, if you're fishing somewhere that is churned up and, and dirty water, or when the res, you know, when the creek is churned up or, or um, any, anything that has some mud in the water, it's good to have a rattle, something that this has a little bit of sound you can hear inside of the lure. Um, it's just this little thing, but if there's, so it's, it's good to have some sound into it. So when you're retrieving it in with your, with your rod or, or bait, it's, 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 uh, it's making noise and potentially the fish have a light, more likelihood of hearing it and investigating. Um, and then you, and then you might set the hook and, and catch, catch them. Um, so uh, that's kind of like the trout and bass kind of world with the lures I just showed you um, with the spin, kind of spin fishing. Um, that's kind of how I catch a lot of trout and bass is like using these tactics and using six pound tests on six foot rods. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about fly fishing in just a moment. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about the American Shad. We talked about it a few minutes ago uh, before the uh, seminar started here, which I want to keep a little bit of tabs on the time. Um, so it's already getting pretty good here. So I'm going to get to some questions here in a minute. Um, this is a Shad dart really quick. Um, these are what Shad darts look like. That's a yellow one, obviously. This is the white and red is pretty, is a, is a uh, very standard color. I don't think the color matters a whole lot. Um, this is a flutter spoon. These can be tied in your line as well um, while shad fishing. Um, the shad are an anadromous fish, which means it swims out of the ocean into um, fresh water to perform its spawn or its uh, offspring um, ritual. And so they swim 330 miles from Delaware Bay, south of Philly, all the way up the Delaware, they even go further, probably closer to 400 miles up the river, up to Dyberry Creek and way up, as long as there's enough water, they're gonna keep swimming. They spawn, they die. People fish for them all the way up the Delaware uh, from way down south to as far north as Hancock or even higher. Um, and they're a fun fish to catch because they're strong. Uh, people call them the Delaware River Tarpon because they're this silver uh, ocean fish that jumps and people enjoy catching strong fish. I mean, that's kind of why we go fishing, um, unless we're fishing strictly for food, in which case, you know, you're doing what you can to catch the, you know, th those fish. You're not necessarily worried about how strong they are. Um, that being said, um, with the American shad, I, what I, was, I just want to kind of reiterate what I said a little bit earlier, but there's a, a reason we have so many eagles here in the upper Delaware is a big part due to the shad because there's no dams on the upper Delaware so they can swim all the way from the ocean to uh, the upper Delaware and then when they spawn they die and then there's dead fish everywhere and it looks like the river's poisoned but it's just actually the the shad are doing their ritual and dying and then the eagles in turn eat all those shad and it's a huge huge part of, of the resource and it also decaying fish provide incredible, incredible resource and nutrients into the river bottom and the river banks and for other fish to eat and, and, and a few, um, a few different, um, you know, big part of the ecosystem. Um, I'm going to do one more like five minute thing on fly fishing here, and then I'm going to open it up to questions and we'll try. And, uh, I think, uh, Dale said he might kind of do the question thing or, or we can just see how, how it works with people volunteering. 
Um, so fly fishing here on the Delaware or in Beaverkill or Willow Weemock, uh, Roscoe is Trout Town, USA. It's in Sullivan County, New or it might be, I'm not sure, Delaware County, Sullivan County. It's in, close by. A lot of people fly fish around here. Um, there's a lot of legendary fly tires. There's a great history behind um, all kinds of the Roscoe and, and Upper Delaware fly fishing um, era. Um, I tie my own flies. I also buy some flies. Um, it's, it's, it's a cool art to be able to tie flies. And it's, it's fun to go out and catch a big fish on the fly you tied. I did it today and I was very satisfied and it was awesome. So um, people, people love that kind of thing. Um, as far as gear goes, nine foot five weight um, fly rods, they're, they're nine feet long, much longer than a spinning rod. Um, generally, nine foot five is like perfect, right? Because this is nine foot five X leader. This is a leader that would get you pretty much, you can catch any fish in the Delaware on this leader, as long as it's, uh, it doesn't have any knots in it and you've tied it correctly and you're using your drag correctly. Um, this will get you started. Uh, uh, you know, a three pack of Rio leaders at nine foot five X or nine foot four X, which is a little bit stronger. It's kind of a weird lingo thing. This is five pound line. So it's instead of six pound, it's five pound. Um, but you have to use a lighter line with fly fishing a lot of the time because you're using those tiny flies that I showed you before. Um, and in this area, you see a lot of bug hatches, so many tons, tons, tons bug hatches, you're driving down the road, down 97, and they're smashing into your car. That's what the fish are eating. They're eating those same bugs. Um, so we go out and imitate these bugs and present them to fish, and then the fish eat them, and, and we are able to catch them, and then, you know, take a picture, let them go. If you want to eat the trout, you keep one trout. Uh, I think it's, I forget what the laws are, but um, you can keep a trout and, and, and eat it. Um, I love fly fishing, dry fly fishing for trout. The Delaware has a huge, huge following in that sense. So I do it a lot. It's part, big part of my job um, and my, my career. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun fishing. Um, and I do it everywhere I go. There's a river every, in every single town in the country or the world pretty much. So I fish pretty much anywhere I go. Um, and uh, so... I don't know. I hope I covered a lot of bases there, kind of the general, like just kind of introductory of what those are a, a six foot fishing, a spinning rod with six pound test um, with a small, you know, a small little rappel like this. I mean, you're going to be able to catch a ton of fish on that basic setup. You really, that's an easy, easy standard setup. And then same thing with the fly rod, a nine foot five weight is great um, um, for that. So um, I guess at this point, uh, you know, I'd like to, I, I know it was kind of a lot of information um, and things like that, but uh, let's open it up to questions. So that way, oh, wait, let me, I have one note here. I just want to talk about really quick. Um, a big part of my job watching the stream flow is the United States Geological Survey, USGS. I look at the flow of the river constantly, every day, probably five times a day, just because I'm addicted to it. But you have to look at the flow. You don't have to, but if you look at the flow and you kind of learn what the temperatures of the river are and then the flow of the river, you can see the patterns um, in which case you might have a good fishing day versus a bad fishing day. And I can pretty much tell you that any time that the water temperature is rising and the flow is rising, it's a perfect scenario to catch a lot of fish or big fish. Um, if both things are going up, temperature and flow are going up, that's the best possible scenario in a stream or lake, or I mean, I'm sorry, a stream or river anywhere around our area or pretty much probably in the entire world. Um, if, if you have adverse, so if like the temperature is going up, but the flow is going down, you could still have a pretty darn good day. Um, but if, you, if the flow is going up and the temperature is going down, you can still have a pretty good day. But if the temperature is going down and the flow is going down, it's likely not as good of a fishing condition. And this kind of falls into that same so lunar calendars looking, you know, it's like kind of like the science behind what we think the fish are doing during certain times of the weather patterns. Um, so you can look at, you know, the moon phases and the water flows and you can build your own scenario, but really just going out and fishing is, is the only way to find out if you're going to catch them. 
Uh, but I just wanted to talk about the United States Geological Survey real quick because uh, it's a really good resource uh, for fishermen all over the country. Um, so let's, uh, let's open it up to some questions or just discussion if anybody would like. Great. Yeah, if you'd like, you can all come off a of mute and activate your cameras if you would like. Um, I'm going to be kind of a little bit of a, a, a hog really quick, Evan. So sure. how, how does someone um, schedule time um, for to go on one of these trips with you? Um, for me, I, so I have, uh, that was one thing I wanted to say. Yeah, the sweet, sweetwaterguide.com is my website and we'll be able to link that up, I think, or something. But sweetwaterguide.com, uh, my phone number is 570-647-7030. It's a good way to get in touch with me. Um, I'm really busy throughout most of May and June. Um, so I'm booking kind of July and August uh, and September, booking trips for the summer, late summer and fall. I do a lot of bass fishing, a lot of walleye fishing and trout fishing uh, that time of year. So yeah, look up Sweetwater Guide Service LLC or uh, give me a call or, or uh, shoot me an email or whatever works. So it's kind of, that's kind of my my contact so where do they take off at where do we meet and take off uh, i fish the entire delaware system so i fish um the east branch the west branch and the main stem down to port jervis so every day i decide kind of different um locations so it sort of depends on what you want to fish for what the weather's doing what time of year it is so that's a big part of my decision making process uh throughout throughout the season. So generally I fish somewhere within about 15 minutes of Calicoon or Narrowsburg. Um, but I try to, I often go as far north as deposit or as far south as Port Jervis. So I fish, I drive, won't be more than an hour and you know, it's an hour and a half from, from this area, Narrowsburg or Calicoon, but yeah. So changes every day. Awesome. Thanks. All right, Evan, I have a question about uh, a lake, uh, about Lake Huntington. Okay. Have you, have you fished on Lake Huntington lady, lately? Because as I drive by the last few years, I don't see too many people fishing. And I was wondering why, because I thought I read something in a local paper that it wasn't good to fish in that lake. Is huh. it polluted or was it not? No, it's it's uh it it still gets fishing pressure. I lived in Lake Huntington actually okay. for, for the past before this year um, for about five summers, and uh, I fished it quite a bit. And then they they do bass tournaments on it in the in the early in the morning. A lot of the bass tournaments okay. are like uh, five to ten a.m. So they start super early. Uh, so that's probably why I don't see people fishing. Okay. Yeah, but but people get out there, and there's a lot of smallmouth bass in Lake Huntington. Yeah, and that's a public ramp right there. Public ramp, office. yeah, public yeah. ramp. Okay. Yep. Uh, okay. It's a good spot. Yeah, it's a good spot to check oh, out. Yeah, so that's the Got closest. Okay, and most of your fishing on the on the Delaware River is off the shore, of course, right? Well, I actually, I fish commercially out of a drift boat, um, so I didn't really mention that a whole lot, but um, I fish out of a boat uh, about 90, 90, more than 90% of the time. Oh, okay. Um, I, but I kind of talk... Fishing from a boat is a lot different than fishing from shore. Um, and so specifically fishing the river from a boat can be, uh, you really have to learn how to handle your boat um, to do it effectively. And that's kind of why I have a job. So it's sort well, of- Well, I'm, uh, I'm mostly, it. I'm up here three years, but basically we had bungalows in Long Island and I'm a 50 baby, uh, since I'm a teenager, saltwater fisherman. Okay. So- you know, I know yeah. how to handle a boat, and I was yeah. debating whether buying a small boat to use at the Narrowsburg ramp right there in that giant pool. I know you can't go too far south. I don't know how far north you could go with a, you know, with a draft of whatever two feet. You know. Yeah, those. Yeah, the um, pretty much any standard any standard uh, boat you can use in the Narrowsburg pool. Um, they work great. You can use yeah. electric motors. Yeah, is there a gas motor size limit? They, there is not a gas motor size limit on the Delaware. However, there is a, a no wake law within 100 feet of shore. 
right. Which is obviously pretty difficult on the Delaware. So yeah. not not many 